Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, May 4th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we're going to recap another Orioles loss. They fall 7-2 to to the Minnesota Twins on Tuesday night and now have dropped the first two games to Minnesota of this series at Camden Yards. I'll get you the five things you need to know from another Orioles loss. Then we'll take a look at one of the Orioles relievers who's had a pretty good year in his transition to the bullpen, and that is Keegan Aiken. Take a closer look at what he's done differently from 2021 to 2022 to make his stats a lot better and keep his spot on this Orioles team for now. And then We'll get you ready for what should be an exciting Wednesday night at Camden Yards as Kyle Bradish makes his second big league start against the former Oriole and the guy who he was traded for in Dylan Bundy, who starts for the Twins in this one Wednesday night. But we will preview that game and talk all things Orioles as that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So we got a game recap to get to, a little Keegan Aiken talk to get to as well on today's episode. And all of that on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by BlueNile.com. This Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked On Orioles listeners get $50 off a purchase of $500 or more. Just use code LOCKEDON at checkout. So we'll start today with a look at the Orioles' loss to the Twins on Tuesday night. But first, again, just want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. Locked On Orioles, free and available on all podcast listening platforms, Apple Pods, Spotify, wherever you listen if you could give us a five-star rating and a review on any of those apps where you listen, that really helps out a lot. And of course, we're here on YouTube as well. Make sure to hit that red subscribe button now, up over 300 subscribers and counting on YouTube. We thank you so much for getting us there. Make sure, as they all say, like, comment, subscribe here on the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel. And again, we're the only Orioles podcast out there bringing you content every day, Monday through Friday, five episodes a week here on the pod. We thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. And for your first listen today, we start with Orioles and Twins. Game two of a four-game series on Tuesday night at Camden Yards. Final score, Twins seven and the Orioles two, as the O's have dropped the first two games of this series. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' seven to two loss to the Twins. And the first thing you need to know is that despite the loss, Bruce Zimmerman continued his great season for the Orioles. Zimmerman's final line on the night in his fifth start of the season, five innings, two runs on four hits. He struck out four and he walked two through 81 pitches. 52 of them were strikes and his ERA now 1.48 on the season. In comparison, John Means, who was incredible early in the year last year, had a 1.50 ERA through his first five starts last season. So an interesting comparison right there. Zimmerman allowed six hard hit balls in this game from the left-hander. And to be honest, he wasn't his best, but he was still pretty good in this one. 11 whiffs in 81 pitches, a pretty solid number for Zimmerman. And the whiffs came from that slider. Six of the 11 swings and misses came off that slider, which was really, really good in this one. He threw... 21 sliders, that was 26% of his pitches. Now, it was, once again, his third most used pitch, but you know he threw 27 fastballs, 23 changeups, and 21 sliders, and you know even two of those fastballs were actually classified as sinkers, so really it was 25 four-seamers, 23 change, 21 sliders. So he was pretty even, and I've been calling again and again for Zimmerman to throw less fastballs because it's his worst pitch, throw more changeups, throw more sliders, and even throw more curveballs, which... In terms of the curveball he did tonight, he threw 10 curveballs in this one, and he got a whiff. He got a couple called strikes. It was a pretty good pitch. That's even more than he usually throws with, of his fourth most used pitch in that curveball. But for Zimmerman, 
you know, the fastball, I will say, was a little better than we've seen. He did get two whiffs on that fastball. Now, it did get hit around a couple of times. And the two hits that allowed a run, the Miranda RBI double in the fourth, and then the Polanco RBI single in the fifth for the Twins, both came off of Zimmerman fastballs. It is definitely still a problem pitch for him, and that's why he's only throwing it 31% of the time. You know, he's not a 50-plus percent fastball guy, but... You know, he got a strikeout with it to start the game against Byron Buxton, one of the best hitters in baseball right now. Got him to chase a high fastball for a swing and a miss. And I thought it looked better with just the command of it at times. Now, listen, Zimmerman's command did go away from him a little bit. He had command issues in the fifth. That's why he gave up a run, and there were a lot of base runners on. He did escape that inning uh, with just the one run allowed in the inning and just the two runs through the fifth, but overall, I thought the slider was really good. The changeup wasn't at its best. I'll tell you that, you know, he got two whiffs on it. It was in the strike zone a good amount, but the command was a little iffy, but he made up for it because that was the best I've ever seen Bruce Zimmerman slider. And when you add in the fastball being a little better and the changeup still being there, I think overall pretty good start once again for Bruce Zimmerman, who is proving with John means out for the year. He is the Orioles ace at the moment. Second thing you need to know from the Orioles' 7-2 loss is that Trey Mancini returned to the Orioles lineup after missing the past three games with some bruised ribs. Bruised those ribs Friday night, uh, running into the wall, making a nice catch in right field early in that game. It was actually in the second inning. He stayed in the game the rest of the game, but uh, then missed all of Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Said it was it was pretty painful, but there was no structural damage. Mancini returned to the lineup as the DH you know, to kind of ease him back in and well, he jumped right back in a two for four day for Trey Mancini, couple of singles, had an RBI, did strike out once, did only have one hard hit ball and his RBI single that, you know, ended up tying the game in the fifth inning. It was not a hard hit ball. It was a little looper that fell over the shortstop's head and in front of the left fielder, but it worked out. It came after a Cedric Mullins double and, and scored him to tie the game at two in the fifth. And, you know, for Mancini, a lot of, Really what's been going on with him this year is, you know, his batting average currently sits at 238, his OPS at 609 on the season. He's in general been getting pretty unlucky this year. He's been hitting the ball hard most of the season and really hasn't been rewarded. So it was interesting to see just one hard hit ball, a bloop single and ending up with a two hit night returning from injury. So maybe, maybe that's a sign of Mancini's luck just starting to turn around just a little bit because, you know, despite the fact that he is hitting 238, his it's his expected batting average, according to fan graphs, is 322 so far this season. So with as hard as he is hitting the ball, he should be getting better results. He his hard hit percentage right now, 53.4 percent. That is a really good number. It should be yielding better stats. And I think going forward, it uh, it will start to yield better stats. He's at a 12.1% barrel percentage, which would be the best of his career. That hard hit percentage, 53.4%, would be the best of his career as well. The sweet spot percentage on the bat, 53.4% would be the best of his career. So, uh, you know, let's keep those things going and the stats will continue to get better for Trey Mancini as he, luckily for the Orioles, does return to the lineup. And you know, despite them only scoring two runs on seven hits, he did help with the run production on Tuesday night. Third thing you need to know is that the replay system is somehow still broken in Major League Baseball. This was a big point of Tuesday night's game. Fourth inning of the game, runners on first and second, and nobody out in the inning. And the O's already had a run in, had tied the game at one in the bottom of the fourth against twin starter Joe Ryan, got some help from a Carlos Correa error um, that uh, tied the game at one. Little side note, uh, Cordell Woodland, the uh, reporter for uh, 105.7 who covers the Orioles and covers the Ravens, actually talked to Carlos Correa before Tuesday's game. And, and Correa told him that, yes, he did have conversations with the Orioles this year, but no, he did not say that uh, there was ever an offer. He said the Orioles did not make an official offer to him, but they did have conversations. So uh, that was that was definitely interesting to uh, hear that from so shout out to Cordell uh, for getting that quote, which we've uh, we've kind of been waiting for from uh, from Carlos Correa since he signed with the Twins. But Correa did make an error in this game. He also went two for five with a couple of doubles, but uh, that tied the game. And then, you know, Anthony Benboom comes up and hits the ball pretty hard. First and second, no outs to the warning track. Byron Buxton makes the catch. 
the runners tag up and, and the runner gets to third easily. And Tyler Nevin, who was on first, tries to go to second. Buxton hits the cutoff man. They throw into second. He's called out trying to get to second for a double play. The replay clearly shows that Nevin got his left hand into second base well before the tag was applied. You watch the replay multiple times. You can go watch it on our Twitter account at Locked on Orioles. The video is up there. It, it seemed pretty straightforward that he was going to be safe. Long review, he was still called out. Really changed the game. You know, should have been second and third with one out. Instead, it was runner on third with two outs. And the next batter, Jorge Mateo, hit a ball pretty hard to right field that had Nevin been safe, would have been a sack fly and given the Orioles a 2-1 to one lead. Instead, it was the third out of the fourth inning. And who knows, maybe that fourth inning continues with more runs and the Orioles get the offense going, but just don't know what's going on with the replay system. But speaking of Tyler Nevin, the fourth thing you need to know from this one is Tyler Nevin actually left the game. You know, it, it, we thought maybe it was on that slide into second base where he was called out, weren't really sure he did stay in and play defense in the top of the fifth, but then in the bottom of the fifth, when uh, he was due up actually on deck and Rugnet Odor struck out to end the inning, it was Ramon Arias who came out in the on-deck circle in his spot, and then Arias immediately replaced him defensively at third base in the top of the sixth, and it turns out that Nevin left the game with right groin soreness. Uh, we haven't heard yet as this time of recording here, about 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Tuesday night, uh, what the, you know, the severity of the injury is for Nevin. Uh, but just something to watch because, of course, the Orioles just did send Ryan McKenna down and DFA Kelvin Gutierrez on Monday in the roster cut down, meaning you know, they have the 26 guys and they only have the 12 players, which means they have the three-man bench. Of course, one of them is the backup catcher. And so, you know, you're looking at a spot where Nevin is really going to be relied on to play a lot and play third, play first, play the corner outfields. If he has to miss a little time, the Orioles are going to have to make a roster move because I'm not sure they would go more than a day or two, you know, with a two man bench. And, you know, they went with a two man bench on Monday night when Trey Mancini was still out. That's about it. You know, and if Nevin is forced to miss maybe more than a game, the O's might have to make a move. So, you know, kind of looking down. In AAA Norfolk, it would seem like it would be time for a Ryland Bannon or probably more likely a Jemai Jones move because Bannon has been ice cold lately. So watch out for potentially this could be what gets Jemai Jones to the big leagues. If this becomes you know more serious than just a day-to-day -day thing for Tyler Nevin, but we'll obviously get you the updates here when we get them. And then the fifth and final thing you need to know from this one is really Joey Crable had his first bad outing of the year. Crable has been so good as a middle reliever out of the Oriole bullpen this year, but uh, just clearly did not have it on Tuesday night when he came into the game. Relieved Bruce Zimmerman in the sixth in a 2-2 ball game. Just didn't have it at all. Out three runs on two hits in that inning of work. No strikeouts, a walk, and of course the big blow was the three-run homer he allowed uh, to Ryan Jeffers hit the three-run shot that put the Twins up 5-2 to two in the sixth, and they would go on to win it, get two more in the ninth, and win it 7-2. to two. But for Crable, you know, he just didn't have that breaking ball and the pitch he threw to Jeffers, which is a cement mixer slider that just hung right in the middle of the zone. And Jeffers clobbered that thing out to left center field into the bullpen for a three run shot. And, you know, even early in the inning, you know, Crable did retire the first batter, but then he gave up a double and a walk. And you could just tell it was not there for Crable. He'll bounce back. He's been really good this year and uh you know he just he just didn't have his best stuff and he he tried to throw that slider at the worst time and that thing got belted out to left center field but that's how it went tuesday night as the orioles fall seven to two to the twins they've dropped the first two of this four game series and uh, the orioles now eight and 16 on the season but you know another guy who did appear in this game and had kind of mixed results for the Orioles on Tuesday night was Keegan Aiken who has been pretty good as kind of a you know bridge guy out of the bullpen this year he had pitched two scoreless innings in the seventh and the eighth on Tuesday then he got into a little trouble in the ninth gave up two runs and uh, Paul Fry had to come in and save him and Fry did do a nice job getting three outs in the top of the ninth inning but even still Keegan Aiken you know, ERA at 2.20 on the season. And that is after a disastrous 2021 for Keegan Aiken. So the question is, what has made Aiken better here in 2022? And coming up next, we will break down, take a closer look into the numbers on why Keegan Aiken is having success in this role this year after struggling so, so much in 2021. But first, 
got to tell you about BlueNile.com because Mother's Day is quickly approaching, just four days away. And whether your mom prefers a statement piece or everyday subtle elegance, BlueNile.com has fine jewelry options for every mom. Shop high-quality classic diamond earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, or gemstone pendant necklaces. And if you're looking for fine jewelry but you're having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has you covered. They have jewelry experts on hand 24-7. They're available by phone or chat to help you find that memorable gift at every budget as well. So if you're not sure how much you can pay, how much you should pay, really what your mom would want, you know, what kind of jewelry is best, Blue Nile not only has the selection for you, but they help you pick out that perfect piece as well. So this Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked On Orioles listeners get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive is only good through Mother's Day. That's this Sunday. So use code Locked On. Again, that is code Locked On. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. So the Orioles fought the twin on Tuesday night, but, you know, there was a couple of still high points from the O's, and one of them was from Keegan Aiken, who, you know, his final line in relief on Tuesday, two innings, two runs, four hits, two Ks, and no walks through 45 pitches, but... He really rolled through his first two innings. He threw a scoreless seventh. He threw a scoreless eighth. Then he came out there in the ninth inning and gave up a double, a single, another hit, and ended up coming out of the game. And, you know, those two runs scored were earned to him as Paul Fry had to come in and get those final three outs at the top of the ninth and clean up his mess. But, you know, even with the two earned runs, Aiken has allowed just a 2.20 ERA so far through 16 and a third innings of relief work this season. Still pretty solid for the role Keegan Aiken has now assumed for the Orioles, which is kind of not exactly long man or mop-up man, but kind of bridge guy out of the bullpen where he's pitching two to three innings every time he goes out there. And I think the goal every time he pitches is for Brandon Hyde to get three innings out of him in relief and kind of be somewhat of a piggyback to a multitude of different starters this year for the Orioles. So the question kind of becomes, you know, why is Aiken pitching so much better this year? I mean, Listen, the O's obviously pitched him mostly in a starting role last year, at least at the beginning of the season, because he had those solid starts late in 2020. But he pitched in relief last year, too, and it was better at times. It wasn't that much better. I mean, you know, he had a 6.63 ERA in 95 big league innings last year. That is not good at all. So the question becomes, what has changed this year? You know, 16 and a third innings, the 2-2-0 ERA. 11 strikeouts to just two walks in that time this year. So what has changed? Well, kind of the easy thing about what has changed is that, you know, this is kind of a surface level. We'll get into why this is happening, but he's just not getting hit nearly as hard. Remember, a hard hit ball, according to StatCast, a ball 95 miles per hour off the bat or higher in terms of the exit velocity. Balls in play off of him were hard hit about 43% of the time last year. This year is down to 27.5%. So that's kind of showing how those numbers are, are so much lower this year. But the question is, why aren't guys squaring him up this year like they did last year? Well, I think one thing to get to is that he's thrown more strikes this year. He's ahead and counts more. He's able to use his off-speed stuff more often because he's throwing more strikes. First of all, let's just look at pitches in the strike zone, in the general strike zone. According to fan graphs, last year he threw about 46% of his pitches in the zone. This year, he's up to 55%, and that goes across the board with all Orioles pitchers. You know, of course, Andy Koska wrote that great story in the Baltimore Sun a couple of weeks ago about how the Orioles changed up their catching philosophy, and the catchers are just setting up down the middle and telling the pitchers, you're throwing it down the middle, and you're going to let the natural movement on your pitches take it to the corners instead of setting up on the corners, trying to nibble and end up walking a lot of guys. And it's working for the Orioles because they're right now top five in strike percentage, in zone percentage, and of all pitching staffs in Major League Baseball. And Keegan Aiken is right along with those guys. And it's also helping the other strikes he's throwing because 
the pitches out of the zone that he's getting for swings and misses and getting for soft contact. It's helping that he's throwing more in the zone because his chase rate last season, which is the percent of pitches out of the zone that guys swing at, was about 24%. So less than a quarter of the pitches he threw out of the zone, guys were, were swinging at. This year, that number, that chase rate is up to 39%. That is the numbers going into Tuesday's outing for Keegan Aiken. So because he's throwing more strikes in the zone, he's getting ahead of hitters more, and then he's getting them to chase more. And all that leads to his stuff just playing better. And his stuff isn't great, but it's not bad. And then, so so let's look at that stuff. And what exactly has changed in the stuff? Well, stuff-wise with the fastball, the velo has been up. And now I will say that's something that's expected. You know, we've seen it from... Jorge Lopez this year went from a starting role to now he's out of the bullpen throwing 98-99 because he's in these shorter stints and he's exerting more effort in the shorter stints. Same thing's happening with Aiken. And, and the flip side happens to guys. You know, we talked about it yesterday with Tyler Wells. You know, last year he was in one inning stints. He was throwing 96-97. Now he's pitching five innings as a starter and he's throwing 93-94. That's, you know, up to 95, but that's just what's going to happen. For Keegan Aiken, Average fastball velocity in 2021, 92 miles an hour. Average fastball velocity this year, 93.2 miles an hour. So he's added a mile per hour on his fastball because, you know, he knows he's not going any more than three innings. He can exert a little more effort into each pitch because he's not trying to get through a lineup three times. And that's working out as well. And, you know, we always knew that the fastball was Keegan Aiken's best pitch. It was the pitch that, you know, helped him win International League Pitcher of the Year in AAA in 2019. You know, it's always been a pretty high spin rate fastball, not amazing velocity, but solid velocity. He likes to throw it up in the zone, let that spin work. And he's getting a lot more swings and misses on that fastball now because the velo is up. The spin rate is very tiny incremental increase. It's basically not statistically significant. So it, it's basically the same kind of spin rate as last year, but with the velo up, that spin rate plays even more, and he's very efficient with his spin on his fastball. And so guys swung and missed at the fastball just 20% of the time last year. Whiff rate on the fastball up to 35.2% of the time this year. So he's getting a lot more swings and misses on his best pitch. That's what happened a lot in AAA in 2019 when he had all the success. That's what's happening again here in 2022. But the real big change for Keegan Aiken, the pitch that has taken him from okay starter at times to bad starter to pretty good bridge relief man is the slider. And the thing I've talked about multiple times here on this podcast is that Keegan Aiken has a pretty good fastball, especially for a guy that throws 92, 93. It's a, it's high spin. He throws it up in the zone. He commands it well. He's always had a good fastball. That's what helped him climb through the minor leagues. But I always thought, you know, yes, he has the slider and yes, he has the changeup and yes, he has the curveball, but none of his off speed pitches were ever plus pitches. They were all, I mean, at their best solid and at their worst, you know, they were a lot of them were bad at times. The change he has made is he now has a good off speed delivery. And although, you know, some people have talked about how his changeup has been solid this year, which it has, it's been a little better. The slider is the pitch that has taken the huge jump. Now, his changeup had always been his number two pitch, and it, it's still a solid pitch, but the slider is now clearly his number two delivery, and it is a good pitch now. He now has two good pitches, and that's why he's putting up the numbers he is in the bullpen. Let's just look at the slider usage. He is now much more confident in this pitch. Through the slider, just shy of 20% of the time in 2021. It was his third most used pitch. He used the changeup more than the slider. This year, He's throwing the slider about 32% of the time. I mean, and with how much he throws a fastball, he still throws his fastball over 50% of the time. It's about 52%. He's basically a fastball slider guy. You know, you add up those two pitches, that's 84% of his offerings are either the fastball or the slider right now. He's basically throwing the change up the rest of the time. He's he's thrown, I believe, five total curveballs all year. He's basically gone away from his curveball completely. But the slider is the pitch. And listen. That thing is completely different. Opponent batting average against the slider last year, 347. Opponent batting average against the slider this year, 056. He hasn't given up anything 
on that slider, basically. And if you look at the StatCast data, which tracks horizontal and vertical movement on pitches, horizontal movement, a good ways more than last year on the slider. Vertical movement, a good ways more than last year on the slider. So the pitch is moving not just away from lefties, but down and away from lefties more and down and into righties more. And he's throwing it to both guys, righties and lefties. It's not just a pitch solely to lefties anymore. And it's working out. And the other thing is you look at the, the heat maps for this year and for last year on where the sliders are in the strike zone, where the ones where he gets swings and misses are. He's just commanding it better. He's throwing the slider generally in the same spot where most lefties will throw it down and away to left-handers and down and into right-handers, but he's commanding it a lot more. He's hitting the corners a lot better with his slider. You can see it on his heat maps. If you head to his stat cast page on Baseball Savant, he's commanding it better. It's got more movement. The velocity is basically the same, but the profile on the pitch is different. The spin rate's basically the same, but the profile on how that pitch moves is different this year. He's throwing it with better command. Guys were squaring up that pitch last year. They can't hit it at all this season and that slider really is what has made Keegan Aiken a different pitcher now will this sustain you know it's only been 16 in the third innings we will see and you know coming into play on Tuesday now I know he did give up uh, a hit with a runner in scoring position on Tuesday but coming into play Tuesday he had not allowed a hit with a runner in scoring position he had allowed seven hits on the year Six of them had come with the bases empty, and one of them had come with a runner on first. So, you know, that's on one hand good that he's, you know, limiting damage, but also a little lucky that you're not giving up any hits with runners in scoring position. He finally gave one up on Tuesday night and was charged with the two earned runs. So maybe that luck will run out. Maybe his stats will come up a little more, but I don't think he's going to be a six plus ERA pitcher this year, especially in this two to three inning role. I think he's figured something out. The question is, can he sustain it this well? Or will he be more of a three to four ERA guy who's expendable? That's still something to figure out. But at the very least, he's figured out what works for him. And he's figured out a secondary pitch, which he has needed all along. And I think Keegan Aiken finally has it in his new and improved slider. But of course, because of the way he's pitching these two to three inning marks, we won't see him for a couple of days, probably see him back out of the bullpen this weekend when the O's take on the Royals. But first, they've got two more games against the Twins, including a fun pitching matchup coming up tonight, which we will get to with a preview of it in just a second. But first, let's talk about Built Bar, the most delicious protein bar out there on the market. These things are not your usual gross-tasting protein bar that you're just eating to get the health benefits. Yes, Built Bars do have the 17 grams of protein, but they also taste like candy bars covered in 100% real chocolate. You're going to forget you're eating a protein bar. It's just a tasty treat that's also good for you. It is the best of all worlds. They've got great flavors like my favorite peanut butter brownie, but also white chocolate chunk, mint chocolate. They've got fruity flavors as well. Anything you could really want, you can get it at Built.com. I just can't believe that they continue to make protein bars that taste this good. So if you want to get your hands on some, Head over to built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Again, that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So Orioles and Twins, game three of four coming up tonight at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. And want to get you ready for that one because it is a very, very fun pitching matchup coming up in this one here on Wednesday night. And uh, first, let's start with the Orioles side because Kyle Bradish makes his second career start in the big leagues. Of course, was called up on Friday and pitched in that game against Boston. Pitched well, six innings, three runs, two earned. He gave up, you know, they got the two strikeouts, just the one walk. And we'll get to see Bradish again. But what makes this so fun is the pitcher on the other side for the Minnesota Twins. It is Dylan Bundy, who is not only a former Oriole, making a return to Camden Yards after the O's traded him a couple off seasons ago. But of course, Bundy and Bradish were traded for each other in that deal that sent Bundy to the Angels for Kyle Bradish, Kyle Brinovich, Zach Peak, and Isaac Matson. And the other part of this is that Bradish had a good Major League debut, and Dylan Bundy has been really good this year. He's still only 29 years old. He's lost basically all fastball velocity. He's throwing 89 to 90 miles an hour, maybe, and sometimes lower. 
but he's changed himself as a pitcher. He's not the high velo guy anymore that he was when he was, you know, 20 years old in the big leagues for the Orioles. He is a different pitcher now, but it's working. Four starts so far this year for Dylan Bundy in a Twins uniform. He has a 2.95 ERA, struck out 19 batters in 21 and a third innings, but he did get knocked around in his last start in Tampa Bay back on Friday night. Six innings, six runs on seven hits. Now, he did strike out seven and walk only two, but the Rays hit him around. He was on a really good run of three starts before that. He was basically un unhittable at times in those first three starts, but the Rays got to him. So we'll see if the Orioles can do what the Rays did to Bundy here on this fun Wednesday night pitching matchup at Camden Yards. And then I will be back with you here tomorrow for another episode of the podcast, recapping game three of this series between the Orioles and the Twins, talking about this fun pitching matchup between Bradish and Bundy and getting to the five things you need to know from the game. And then, you know, today we took a look at Keegan Aiken. Tomorrow, a closer look at Jorge Lopez, because if you want to talk about the breakout star of a guy going from the Oreo rotation to the bullpen, it is, of course, Jorge Lopez this season. And we are going to be joined by Justin Choi. He is a writer for Fangraphs who recently wrote about the Orioles bullpen for Fangraphs, specifically Jorge Lopez and what he has changed to make himself, honestly, a dominant closer in baseball so far this season. So that's all coming up on tomorrow's episode. You won't want to miss that one. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.